I've wondered for weeks whether or not to have the conversation we are about to have. I've wondered not because I don't think my guest will be worth your time, and no, of course not, but rather that there are so many new artificial intelligence products out there that you almost need an AI to count them. So which ones are really worth your time? Well, ultimately, I found a single data point that told me I needed to bring our guest today in for a conversation. Since October the 1st, and we're recording this in mid-November, I've logged into his AI service 268 times from my laptop alone. I also have the app on my phone. I use it every day and it's displacing a large number of my Google searches. The product itself? Perplexity.ai. And I thought no better than to speak to the man behind it, Aravind Srinivas, the CEO and co-founder of the firm. He's hot on the heels of a huge funding round from top tier investors and the product itself, as well as my few hundred queries a month, is seeing tens of millions of users monthly. Uh, Aravind, welcome to the conversation. Uh, thank you for having me, Azim. So uh, maybe I thought we'd start uh, with you know, your, this kind of amazing uh, product, per Perplexity, which I would say it's a, you know, it's a question query engine. It, it is a way of finding out answers to quite often quite complex queries. Uh, for an old timer like me, I think back to a product like Ask Jeeves from the early 90s, which attempted to do this. And uh, I was an investor in PowerSet, uh, which uh, uh, tried to do this, was ultimately acquired by Microsoft um, back about a decade ago. Uh, but it feels to me like perplexity has actually worked. You put a question in, and you get quite a complex answer out. And I thought maybe uh, what we could do is perhaps start by sharing uh, some of our favorite queries. I was looking to buy an engagement ring for my, when I was proposing to my partner at the time. So um, so the, the query was pretty complex. It was like, um, what is, where can I get a diamond ring uh, for a proposal that would be within, you know, small budget because you know i was not like super into very expensive ones and i can and i can find it in san francisco so that you know you can actually go and try and it's not like low quality it's still pretty good quality and uh, it suggested this place where we went and bought and like it was done like that quick um and then at the end of the day at the end at the end after we made the purchase the person there running the shop asked me, so how do you discover us? Is it through yeah. Google or Facebook or friends? I said, uh, it's through this thing called perplexity. That's a great example. The, the, the engagement ring uh, is something that will be with you for decades or with your partner for, for decades. Yeah. Uh, let's kind of play through that a little bit, right? So why would a query like that be, be difficult on, on Google, for, for example? Yeah, uh, it's very simple, actually. Um, for the good or bad, they've gotten themselves into a position where uh, if you type anything that's like engagement ring or like uh, they just have to show you um, 10 or 10 or 15 sites that are bidding for that keyword. Right. And, 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 and uh, it's in their incentive for you to click as many links that they show in the 10 blue links and you click on them. And um, you open all these tabs and you read and sit and like decide. Um, it's not in their incentive to just give you the answer. It's not, in, it's, it's that whole interface and business model built on that interface that basically bankrolls the company mm -hmm. is built around wasting your time. Right. Right. So, so, used so that's to be... where the opportunity and the window for another product like us comes in where even, even if they know that this really works, which I'm sure they do, um, they don't have an incentive to actually go and change it to the you know the billions of people who use Google every day. You've painted a, a picture of what Clayton Christensen uh, passed away a, a couple of years ago would call the innovator's dilemma. Innovator's dilemma, yeah. Right, the business model doesn't allow them uh, to, to do that. And, I mean, I love your example. It is so powerful and I forgot to say to you, many congratulations Thank you. and uh, you know, many, many decades of happiness ahead. Uh, I'll show you my, my example because the query that I put in, um, I would, I think would have I would have really struggled um, on on Google to 
get the quality of answers um, that I ultimately got from Perplexity in less than half a day's work. Uh, so behind me I have some new shelves. They are uh, Dieter Ram's shelves called Vitso. And I wanted to find uh, lights to illuminate uh, the, the display shelf that I have behind me. Uh, so I went to Perplexity and I said, I have Vitso shelves and I'm looking for narrow profile lights I can mount under the shelves to throw light onto the shelf below. Any suggestions? Now, first of all, I've read that out verbatim. It's kind of a terrible search query because I repeat myself and you know, I'm using loads of words. And, and the response uh, that I get uh, is, you know, I found a few options and it gives me four options. And I went back to it and said, listen, these aren't bad suggestions. Please find me some more. Um, and it came out with some, some others. A and of course, you know, I had tried su subsequently to do this on Amazon and to do this on Google. And it's really, really difficult. And so I, I, I must have saved, as I said, hours uh, on that particular search. Uh, I took yep. your recommendation. I went to IKEA, <laughs> as it happened. Thank you very much. Um, why, why does it work? Because it strikes me it works not just because, say, Google or Bing's business model doesn't work. There is something else that you're doing. You are, you are working with um, a whole range of underlying websites who may have better or worse ways of organizing their information. And you're, you're able to go into those and, and assemble an answer that works really well. Yeah, so I think all this needs to happen really fast, right? Like the moment you submit a query, um, obviously we're doing all the work that a typical person browsing the website, br browsing and opening all these sites and reading all the contents in those sites would have done. Um, imagine the equivalent of human labor in trying to write a Wikipedia article for the question you asked, right. but um, done in one or two seconds. Yeah. And on demand, 24-7. Dig deeper, ask clarifying questions, and ask any number of questions. No amount of like judgment. You can ask anything you want. That is what you're getting today. Like in our case, um, you get the feeling of talking to someone who's researched a lot out of um, diamond rings. Mm -hmm. Like they know so much that, uh, right. you know, oh, like it's like talking to the expert. And, and at the heart of this, uh, this, this product, I mean, I, I feel I ought to also share that one of the things that I have discovered in the at least 268 query sessions I've had with it in, in six weeks uh, is you reference uh, the results. So every time I get a, a, a result telling yeah. me about a particular uh, LED light or a way of changing my LAN configuration or uh, something about human brain capacity, which I was researching for my new book, um, you give me a reference that I can I can see and I can link and I can go to the underlying source, which gives you a lot of confidence, right? And and this is all built though on um, a series of you know the technology du jour, which is large language models, and and you you have your own large language models and you access um, OpenAI's GPT three point five and GPT four, which people will have used if they've used Bing Chat or or OpenAI's uh, Chat GPT. How, how does it, you know? How does that come together in delivering the experience that that I get? The best way to think about it is um, the search index. The typical traditional search index is sort of like the um, the knowledge engine. You can call it the knowledge engine, uh, and 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 the large language model. You can call it the reasoning engine. The the one that with the expressivity of human natural language and ability to reason from um, on a particular skill or a task. And these two com come together uh, to provide you uh, a an answer engine, which is what we are. And with the chat capability, which is again a skill of the reasoning engine, it becomes a conversational answer engine and therefore it becomes like an answer bot that you keep talking to, right? Um, the magic is actually that the speed at which you get the responses mm -hmm. is almost the same as uh, the speed at which you get the response from a traditional chatbot that has no plug-in to the actual search index. Right. 
that is actually the major difference in perplexity. Like, like how fast it is and how accurate it is, despite doing a lot of work on the back end, mm. where it's not just using one engine, but two engines, yeah. um, and orchestrating the two together. Right? You, you know, th th I think there's a, there's a misunderstanding, um, you know, out there broadly that uh, the product is the LLM that you just, you just get the LLM and you, you train yeah. it on three trillion tokens, you give it yeah. loads of parameters and that's the product. But, but in fact, the right. LLM is like the internal combustion engine, which exactly. drives very exactly. differently in a Ferrari to a Cadillac, right? So how did you think about that? And how have you managed to get this latency super, super low? Is, is it about, you know, architectural optimizations? Is it about the, the internal actual architectural relationship between the systems? Is it about the amount of compute that you throw yeah. at the problem? Yeah, so you can you can optimize the latency in three different ways. One is you optimize the individual latency of each engine, like you make the LLM more optimized or you make the search index more optimized. Um, and uh, the orchestration is also another place where, where, where you orchestrate these two engines together. Uh, you can optimize that too. And all these three optimizations are important for making the end um, users latency better right uh, and it's not just the latency by the way the throughput also matters like um, when, when there are like 10,000 users using the product at once you don't want to just focus on the latency and that happens when there's spike usage let's say when chat GPT is down a lot of people come to us right like those kind of moments um, you kind of want to be ready for those kind of moments and also, there are sometimes, oh, suddenly somebody tweets about perplexity and they have like millions of followers and like mm -hmm. thousands of people come and check it all at once. You don't want the site to crash though during those moments, right? Or let's say we depend on OpenAI for model, as a model provider and uh, one day they're having some outage and if all the nodes go away, uh, we still should be able to serve the product because at the end of the day, the user doesn't care. The user all they want is the answer. It takes perspective, right? It, you you got to build that perspective, uh, not just yourself, but everybody in the company should build that perspective because typically AI people, they pride themselves more on the quality of the model, the demos, right? right? But for the user, okay, here is the app. This is an app where I can ask a question, I get the answer and I get sources and it's pretty accurate. And yeah. I can ask follow-ups, that's it. You nail this, you, you nail this, your job is to only nail this, you can ask follow-ups. That's it, you nail this, you, you nail this, your job is to only nail this, and then rest of the brand and like everything's taken care of. So, and, and, and for that, you gotta do a lot more than just train the best model or fine tune the just mo best model, or you gotta do a lot more than just being the best search index there is. Um, you got to do everything and optimize for the end-to-end -end experience. Yeah, I mean that's certainly one of the things that I feel when I when I use uh, you know use perplexity eight ten times a day. And, but I'm curious about that point that you made, which is like you know a lot of the AI community is still coming out of the research world, so they are focused on a on the model itself. Perhaps they're focused on ro product uh, sorry scientific robustness uh, rather than productization. And I think you spent time both at DeepMind and and open AI. So I'm curious about the culture that you're building in perplexity, right? What are the bits that you're yeah. borrowing from the places that you worked at before? And what are the things that you're leaving behind? Um, so I think the culture I'm borrowing from open AI is this um, iteration, it, iteration culture, like don't just wait for perfection, try to iterate a lot and speed the urgency with which we got to get it out in the hands of users. And um, more important to actually have something usable than something that's just uh, uh, benchmarks and things like that. So that's the culture from OpenAI. The culture from DeepMind is kind of like the perfection mindset. Right. Uh, OpenAI is the iteration mindset. And I think the, you obviously want to have a bit of both. Um, maybe we are more like 80-20, 80, 80 OpenAI, 20 DeepMind, where we care obviously about perfection and those you know, the, the finer elements of magic that DeepMind inserts into their releases. I really admire that. And it's, it's all coming from Demis himself, which is, mm -hmm. you know, um, he cares a lot about like magical moments. He really so does, yeah. We, do that. we try to do some of these and the answers, like 
oh how does this AI even know like that's crazy like those those are wow moments need to be there but um, you cannot like do it um, at a slow pace in the startup world because otherwise somebody else is going to eat your lunch right like so I think that's what Google called their code red at the start yep, of uh, exactly. this year yeah. right when chat GPT came out um, and so when you, you you talked about model benchmarks, right? So the benchmark is the uh, you know is how well is the model performing on yeah uh, these different te ways of testing it, MMLU and so on and so forth. And um, it, it's a it's a matter of pride, right? When people release their models on Twitter, particularly in kind of open source, they'll go off and say, oh, we you know we we beat this code benchmark. Do, do you care that much about about benchmarks in that sense? I do. Yeah, I'm mean, here's the thing, right? Like. Where people claim a lot of benchmark beating achievements, but when you actually use it in the form of a chat product, it, it doesn't work as well. So it's very easy to hack benchmarks by just trying to, to create a data set specifically for that benchmark, yes. training for it, and then you show good performance. But the magic of these general usable chat products is that you'd never optimize for one benchmark, yet you are really good at it. Right. Um, and that's the kind of model that makes for a very robust product because people typically use it in all sorts of ways. So you are not optimizing for one benchmark, you're optimizing for like so many benchmarks at once in a yeah. manner that um, when you actually um, put it out, no matter how the user tries to use the product, it just still works. Mm. And, 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 um, and, and, that's why like I'm I'm more a fan of like tracking five or ten benchmarks at once rather than one benchmark. Right, right. And and I guess those are the those are the technical benchmarks on how the models perform in these in these sort of lab experiments. But I, I guess now that you've got a product out in the market, yeah, yeah. We, you're we, also we, considering we, about retention and searches per user right, yeah. and so on. Yeah, you have to run a lot of A B tests on different models and see how people react and how many how many has the queries per user gone up has um or or, or even run evaluations uh, on a user of like okay if you have an existing model and you have a new model and the new model is cheaper than the existing model to serve then what is the one bit that you need to decide if you if you can switch over the one bit that you need is whether quality has not regressed right right and and and, and you would measure that by saying uh you you, you give a human the answers from both different both the models and ask them if you know which model is better but the, the challenge you've got is that is that you know people will use this for every type of query from from engagement rings to cancer therapies from lights right. under their bookshelf right. shelf to competitive analysis That's right. uh, and so that that a b test is is pretty complex right i mean to get a statistical exactly. sample must well, it's probably easier now because you've got millions of users using the service, but That's right. it would have been hard in the, those original days, right? That's right. Uh, I think like we probably would benefit a lot from like, you know, having even more users so that even A-B testing to a small fraction of the traffic gives you a lot of data. But I think the best way to do this is like sample representative queries from your usage and right provide it to independent evaluators and then ask them to, and if the user is not able to say which model gave what, especially when it's against a faster, cheaper model versus a slower, smarter, like like a more expensive model, mm. then the decision is very clear. You, you switch over to this cheaper right. model, right? Right. And, and these are the kind of optimizations that are very hard, by the way, because uh, often what happens when you train a cheaper model, uh, which is faster, is that there will be some regressions. Uh, this happens even for big companies like OpenAI. Like, look, look at their announcement they made in uh, the developer day about GPT-4 Turbo mm. when uh, they claimed it's uh, going to be a cheaper model and also better than GPT-4. Right. But then people on Reddit are ha having an outrage of, oh, it's not actually better. Like, look at all the stuff it used to be capable of before and now it cannot. So that means what? It, it doesn't mean that OpenAI is not good at... Um, evaluations it means something despite doing all that they missed out on some ways right. to make yeah. so, right. so you've you've put your finger on something that um, I think is really challenging for building with with LLMs building with these new 
databases or new internal combustion engines, yeah. which is that, you know, when I was a product manager, I, I built products with underlying technologies that were deterministic. They did the thing that you asked them to do the same way every single time. Um, and you could you could test their parameters much more much more easily. And I think one of the things that, that large enterprises are also struggling with as they try to build products using LLMs is the the statistical nature, right, of LLM outputs. This idea that the the frontier of capability um, is is not very well known and it's not very well defined. It's a little bit fuzzy. One of my friends calls it the the jagged frontier, right, that, that of, of, of capability. And especially as you make model improvements, either through, you know, uh, you know optimizing them so that they're, they're faster or you, you, you retrain them, you, you may in general improve things, but there may be very specific areas where things get, get worse. And one of the things I was so fascinated about perplexity is that I think you are one of the first couple of companies who's got a working product that is built with LLMs as part of its components, it's working at some scale. And, and you seem to have established perhaps this new discipline, this new product engineering discipline, which is how do you build with these, these kind of random acting Pokemon LLMs? I think like the one thing that um, I have personally stuck with as a wisdom is something Jeff Bezos said very early on in Amazon days is, the user doesn't care, the, and the user is most always right. So user, no, I'm not talking about user suggesting you what to do, but mm -hmm. the user telling you what their problems are, you, you, they're most likely right, and, 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 and the user doesn't care how hard it is for you to solve their problems. Uh, let me expand on this. So if you actually need to serve a cheaper model because it's just inefficient for you to like uh, run the product otherwise um, your profitability is not their concern right just like for Amazon this in one or two days is actually something that makes Amazon run um, and they keep burning money because of that right but because of that if Bezos chose to increase the prices of the goods or increase the number of days of, of delivery from like say one or two days to like three days or five days um, that would solve the problem or like at least address it to some extent mm. but the user doesn't care like someone else is going to offer the more superior terms and they're going to ship it over yeah. um, so the, the same thing applies to us for serving this particular product like if there is a way to like cut down costs and sort of less accurate answers or less reliable product that's never up all the time or slower product, mm -hmm. we are done. Like, and, and, but that's, and, a guiding, uh, that's a guiding philosophy, Arvind, right? So that is a guiding philosophy that you and your co-founders are, are establishing yeah. as a cultural um, attribute of the, of the company. But I, I'm also curious internally about what it means for uh, you know, product management, right, and the decisions that you make about wh whether you even know a model is right for, for deployment. Yeah, 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 so that's right. So a model is right for deployment only if it's more accurate. Right, That's v it. via your testing that you've done and yeah. the, the yeah. representative queries. Yeah. And, and if the user complains it's not right, then you, you gotta switch, over, switch back, yeah. you know. Yeah. There, and, and you, okay, like you first should feel good about it yourself. Like, the, the, the advantage of working on this particular area, consumer search, is that we all can use the product. Like I can use it, my co-founders can use it, employees can use it. So we all can use the product and we all can test the product. And um, this ensures that like we ourselves know that this is a model we, are, we would love to use. Mm. When GPT-4 came, it was pretty clear that, you know, what happened was, let me tell you how, exactly how models basically made the product a lot better. Mm -hmm. We had prototyped this version of the product in like September, October last year. It would hallucinate a lot. This was GPT 3.5, DaVinci 2 days, not even DaVinci 3. So, so hallucination meaning it would come up with sort of plausible sounding but wrong text, that's right. largely because it's using earlier versions of open AI models. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And then open AI, uh, three or four days before ChatGPT released, 
they they uh, updated davinci to to davinci 3 it's the same gpt 3.5 but much much better train model and we switched over we just literally changed the 2 to 3 in the code and use the product and it just got insanely better like hallucinations dropped a lot significantly and, and then when gpt 3.5 turbo came it got a lot faster and cheaper and more accurate right and then when gpt 4 came it was just like mind blowing it it's not cheaper and faster but hallucinations are like 1 in 100 now right right and so if you existed in the world in like late 2022 and 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 looked at this sort of answer engine product you would be like okay this is cool but you know one in a 10 queries are wrong you know it's not going to make it but now you're like damn there is one model that basically makes the hallucination problem almost irrelevant it's expensive but now what is the bet you're going to make on the future the bet you're going to make on the future is that whatever this model is today that hallucinates one in a 100 times that will be 10 10x cheaper over right. the years to come this is the most expensive and the least accurate exactly this be. is the most expensive and least accurate it'll ever be right, right? that that for the same cost that we pay for gpt4 today there will be a gpt4 and a half or five that is even better even better in terms of um reliability and the accuracy and like this conciseness of the ants don't over index on the problems that exist today that you we've already got the 80 20 on this product that, mm. that that's that's how I, i feel today yeah and and the the remaining 20 is going to take a lot of effort in fact 80% of the effort will take on the last 20% of the product I, i and that's why the company exists right the company exists to solve these long tail problems right can i can Program- i ask on that on that 80 20 effort yeah. thing so thinking about where we are today yeah i'm thinking about just i'd be you know i'm a fanboy here right so thinking about just how good the product is today if you go back 12 months ago is the perplexity answer quality much better than you would have expected from 12 months ago or is it about the same or do you think we it's it's not as good as you'd expected i mean it improves every every few weeks right right like i mean is that was that in line with your expectations of what the improvement curve would have looked like um it 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 exceeded my expectations honestly um mainly because the the uh, the models got a lot smarter uh, one of our investors daniel gross he yeah. he does this fund with nat friedman mm-hmm. um before we released the first version of perplexity i had been sending it around to friends asking for feedback and 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 not not a lot of people tried it but daniel was one of the few people because he tried a search engine himself as his first startup right and um the first feedback he gave the first sentence i remember is like you should call it a submit button not a not a you you, you should call it a submit or a run, run button right instead of instead of uh, like like hit button for the search yeah. query because it's that slow like it's it takes it's like, like you have to send instructions to to like a a batch processing system yeah, come exactly. back a few minutes later yeah 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 it yeah. it it takes like 7 to 10 seconds to get the answer Right. Now you get the answer like one second or lower, right? Um, in, in in when when you are on the free version of the product and not not using GPT four, the latency is almost so fast that people are like, oh, how did you make it this fast? It's the same model, right? I mean, more improved version of the model, but the same architecture. Um, and 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 um. you know give, give us 12 months and we made it a lot faster now give us 12 more months we make it even faster right so give us 5 years you're going to see this answer engine thing as fast as the load time of the 10 blue links right 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 and, and one of the beauties is that you don't have advertising right so you you we yeah. pay yeah, we're we're gonna gonna a month i think and and is is that you know what that does is that that avoids that incentive misalignment that we see on Google where what the 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 user needs is traded off against what the advertiser needs and the experience right. is compromised. Oh that's another thing where the Bezos thing applies. Right. You, you, your shareholder interests and your user interests should always be aligned. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. and 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 in Google's case it is aligned where the user is the advertiser. <laughs> right. 
Yeah. So, so Google it, is basically two products. Yeah. There's a Google search engine. That's an amazing product. And there's a Google AdWords and AdSense. That's also an amazing product. And the only thing they did is they coupled the two together where the platform for the ad product is the search engine, right? right? And now the shareholder, the company is such a large publicly traded behemoth that the only thing the shareholders care about is, is your advertising revenue going up quarter by quarter? Yeah. Do whatever you can to keep it going up. If it could mean getting your ads from the left to right below the search bar, increasing the font size of the ads, adding more ads in the search results page and like, um, you know, like basically whatever needed to hit the metrics. Because what's yeah. the Wall Street ones, right? And, and, and that's where I think you, 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 if you compromise on what the user wants at the end of the day, the search engine user, this right. is what you're going to end up with. That's what you end and that's up why with. I like, really, I, I like Amazon, right? Like Amazon needed to make money too. It wanted to be profitable too. Mm. But the way it did it is through the cloud business. Yeah. Cloud business Look, became profitable. It, it can, and, and, you know, Amazon is not without those internal tensions now that it has an advertising business. Sure, it sure. Has now it's there in the core, like, yeah. Yeah, they've got a few other things. Now, I, I love this conversation. I love getting inside the, the founder's head um, to, to, to understand your journey. But, but I also know that the Exponential View uh, audience will be really, really keen to understand, um, you know, your thoughts on, um, you know, how this affects knowledge workers and who stands to, to, to gain from these technologies, what the impacts might be, and also your thoughts on the, um, the sort of emerging landscape of AI from closed source to open source um, and, and the way in which some of the wider AI debate has, has, has gone and, and fundamentally how you think the next few years might, might play out. I mean, I, I think that those are really um, key questions. Maybe we can turn to that first one, which is thinking about, you know, who are the, who are the roles right, what, that, that are going to benefit most from something like perplexity. You go back to um, the research around, um, you know, what jobs were going to get impacted by, by AI going back a decade. The general view was that it was going to be the routine cognitive jobs, right? People in accounting, bookkeeping, data entry, and that those in cognitive, creative roles would not be impacted. But the first tests and results, and some colleagues at Harvard Business School did this with, with BCG when they put consultants in front of uh, ChatGPT was they discovered that consultants got much more productive and produced higher quality work, um, even in non-routine circumstances. And the, the lowest performers were the ones who saw the much, much higher um, uplift than the higher performers. So it's been quite curious, right? All the assumptions that, that economists were making um, seem to be being a little bit unpicked by this LLM revolution. So when, when you look at this and you're seeing tens of millions of queries a, a day, how do you think about, you know, who, what jobs, what roles are going to benefit from, uh, you know, the, the wider rollout of, of LLMs through the, through the economy? I think like more than focusing on any particular sector, let's focus a bit more on, you know, the higher level abstract picture of Let's let's maybe zoom out from the perspective of somebody running the business, right? Um, now, Azim, you might be able to run your company uh, with fewer people now. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you get the sort of suite of AI workers for you. Like there's an AI that you use for summarizing your transcripts from your podcast. There is an right. AI you use for cleaning up the transcripts. There's an AI you use for uh, editing the the like ums and ahs, right? Mm -hmm. um, overdubs. And then there's an AI you use for actually like marketing your content. So these are all like earlier you would actually have to go sign some contract with some freelancer or, or, or a consultant and then you pay them instead of paying an AI. But that doesn't mean you're still not going to go to somebody else for help, but you, you, it, it, you're getting the 80-20 with the AI now, right? On, on, on a lot of these tasks. Mm. And I think what it would lead to is the following reallocation of capital, mm -hmm. where there are more people who would explore 
their own self-funded businesses instead of working for somebody else. And the, and the people who are starting those businesses or the existing people who already run those businesses will be able to do it with fewer people. Right. So, so that, so, that first category essentially is people who now sell quite narrow skills because they know, you know, copywriting or bookkeeping, but they don't know marketing or some other skill, but they can now get those skills hired in for 15 bucks a month via an AI system. That's right. Yeah. So I think that's where we, we're going to like head towards a world where people are more entrepreneurial. Uh, and, and those who are entrepreneurial, those who are creative will make good use of these AIs and spend less in order to achieve more. Right. But this is a mindset. This is a mindset that not a lot of people have. And yes. therefore, yeah, and, 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 and for this mindset to be like something that, um, you know, emerges widespread in the population is going to take a while. And, when, and, and, and during the adjustment process where the mindset changes, you're going to see a lot of people who do lose jobs and don't really know how to make good use of AIs and um, are going to be at a disadvantage compared to those who have, you know, those who know how to make good use of AIs. Because what's going to happen is people are going to have to hire fewer people, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and if that that's the situation, then um, if if you hire fewer people in the world, then you're you're you're, you're just basically saying okay. Every organization can be 80% smaller. So what happens to that 20% in each organization? So that, that period will be pretty difficult for all of us. It's not going to affect one sector more than any other. Different, what's different about this time around, I guess, to, to previous times where we've seen te technology transitions is that um, when we saw new technologies introduced in history, uh, yep. you, you, you were given the, the proposal was reskilling and upskilling, right? So when mechanization came in to the um, clothing industry uh, and the cloth industry in, in England in the uh, 18th and 19th century, the people who used the looms required upskilling and, and, and more, you know, more skilling, but the fundamental nature of the employment relationship uh, it, it evolved into one of greater stability in empl employment rather than, rather than less stability. And I think what, what I'm hearing in, in your kind of perspective on this is, well, there are going to be new skills that you need to, to develop and take on, even if it is just the 10% the to ask the marketing question of the AI. Um, but there's also going to be a deep pressure on the, 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 the trade-off between autonomy and security, where particularly in, in richer Western countries, people have been moving in the direction the last couple of hundred years of much, much more, you know, job security. And, I, you know, I think you, you say it as like, well, this is going to take, require a mindset shift um, of quite, I mean, staggering proportions in, in that sense, right? I don't know what the most articulate way of saying this is, but everybody who's running an organization or, or a business would prefer to have some human doing a task if right. only they can offer something that an AI cannot, which I'm yeah. still saying there is plenty of room right. for those things. But also, who are those people who are likely to offer you that? Are those who really uh, already know how to use AI as well and mm -hmm. know what they can offer on top of that? Yeah. Versus people who are fighting AIs. Because... I don't think we should think about this as human versus AI and AI is going to like take over me and I'm going to stop the AIs from proliferating the world. It's more like, hey, what are you doing today that's mundane and repetitive? And, and, and can you use an AI for that? And, and what can you channelize your brain towards now? I mean, I think that the, the kind of abstract path that you describe makes, um, you know, it makes, it makes lots of sense. So, it's, I mean, essentially the... The argument that is often put out is, you know, the horse came along, in came the motor car, the horse didn't retrain, and it became glue. Uh, and what we're saying, you know, essentially is, in comes a new technology, it kind of expands capabilities within the economy, people who retrain um, should be able to, to move up. And, and there is a counter argument that says, but the difference is that AI will get so 
powerful that the space yeah. of possibility and input for the human will decline further and further and further and that could be a problem and it sounds to me that you're you don't think that that latter outcome is either likely uh, or, or or plausible in in the short term is that is that reasonable i think so i i, I that's reasonable um it i still think that ai is still at a point where it, it's in the co-pilot phase where right. it really benefits from working together with the human i mean today we're using ai as a sort of like mundane things that we don't want to do mm-hmm. tomorrow we are going to use as not just for mundane things but also like suggest us what to do because you know coming up with new ideas is also hard right yeah. and then tomorrow and, and then day after tomorrow we're going to be like hey like just do this for me you think about the idea you think about how to do it and you and i and, and get my approval in for intermediate steps and i'm just going to like approve like a notification yeah. on my phone um so we are still going to live in this world at least for the next 10 years i think where ais are co-pilots but their uh the, the percentage of work done by them increases you you know that i i i like what you the way you frame that um i think what it says is um roughly um you have a you've made a, an assessment of um of the development that you can see through these products built on LLMs, because it's not just the LLMs. Um, and and that idea that we have a all singing, all capable AGI that is that can generalize across anything as well as any human, um, you know, it, it is, is unlikely to be a 2026 mm-hmm. product announcement, right? Is that roughly what I'm, you know, what I'm hearing from you, right? So, yeah, so, so right. that that makes me, me ask that question about, um, you know, when we look at the technology, I think this is a huge question in um, in public policy. It's a huge question in in, in public debate around dinner tables, which is um, have we have we actually figured out how to build that type of uh, you know silicon based cognitive capability, and now it's just a matter of building it. Or actually, do we just have some really, really impressive ladders right now, and we can continue to build those ladders? And we need to actually find, um, you know, we, we we are we are still safe in some sense. We need to find that new scientific approach uh, to 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 get up to the moon, right? Where, where where do you stand on that? Do we do we know how to do it, or do we still need to figure it out? I think we might know largely how to do it, but we still don't know the exact zip code of like. We, we kind of roughly know the area, but I still think we don't know the exact zip code of where it is. And, and uh, so I still think some amount of research needs to be done there. Um, I think LLMs and Alpha Zero are two of the major innovations in AI, if you, right. if you were to pick two most important things. And, and just, just to clarify for the for listeners, so Alpha Zero was um, uh, Google's general game playing uh, system that could play many different types of games without instruction um, and also improved by playing against itself That's right. many, many times. Self-play. Yeah, recursive right. self-improvement through playing against yourself. And I think that has only worked in a situation where you have rules of a game and that was a winner and that was a clear win-loss. Right. Uh, it hasn't worked in a way where it's open-ended, which is how the real world is. The real world is not about like competing and winning, right? Um, it's only zero sum when there is an upper bound on what the total gain is. Right. But humanity has always been about unbounded potential. Like we keep increasing the economic capital in the world, right? So yeah. in, in such a world, like we don't have a, the equivalent of alpha zero yet. But if we figure it out, think about this, right? LLMs are trained on internet data. It's bootstrapped. Think about internet data as human intelligence's footprint on the internet. Mm-hmm. Human thought process. Right. Human articulate, articulation. Human reasoning. All the code that we've written is like uh, footprints of biological reasoning on GitHub, right? Yes. Now we've distilled all of that into neural nets. Now that's the, the first step of AlphaGo. 
where it learned from all the Go ma- games that have already been played and fine-tuned on experts, right? Mm-hmm. That was good enough to get us to, to, to a certain extent. Like, against the European champion, we were good. But you needed the tree search component to beat Lee Zero, right? right? And then you needed something like Alpha Zero, where it would just train against itself for, like, generations of games. Yeah, but I guess um, I guess the difference between those, as you say, is that um, first of all they are they're finite. Uh, there's a defined payoff. That's right. Um, the rules are um, are are known, right? So there's some there's some grammatical structure that underlies the patterns of, right. of, of data. And I guess one of the things that that people argue, maybe Stephen Wolfram argues this a little bit, that that what we're discovering through LLMs is that there are rules of reasoning and rules of language that are not visible, you know, in a single Shakespearean play, but across three trillion words of human language in a high enough dimensional space are there. They are visible and they do, they may end up acting as guideposts towards, um, you know, this, this generalized intelligence. I mean, is, is that a, is that a kind of reasonable description of how you might think about it? Yeah, that's pretty reasonable. And, um, and I think like, when we are at a point where the LLMs are able to generate the data for the next epoch of the LLM training themselves, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's when there is a genuine chance for a recursive yeah. self-improvement to happen. Like, like, like in the sense, GPT-4 autonomously decides, not, not with human help, not mm-hmm. with human feedback and curation. I'm talking about a world where GPT-N decides the data for GPT-N plus one has no human annotation in the loop, itself refines the data, trains on it, gets to a more improved version, and repeats. Right. This well, is I the mean, autopilot error. Yeah, but, but I mean, I guess I guess the challenge um, the challenge in that is about how that gets anchored back to the back to the actual sort of real world, the physics of the real world, the relationality of the, of the real world. I mean, it's, I think it's one thing if you're constructing. Um, you know, certain classes of, uh, of, of of creative endeavor, right? Whether it's fiction or whether it's it's um, uh, certain types of art. But if you're trying to use these things in kind of an engineering context, you need to somehow bound them back to the Carnot cycle or the second law of thermodynamics or the law of gravity. That's and right. How, how does that happen in a in a world of 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 self generated data without without providing an internal world model for the, the system itself. Yeah, so that's how we, we need to keep humans in the loop. Right. We need to ground it to like human utility and value functions. And um, and there are physical limits still. It's not like unbounded, like in the sense there are only a certain number of GPUs you can have. GPUs work according to the laws of physics, speed of light, right. uh, speed of an electron, right? And then uh, there's obviously like, how many chips can you package within a certain surface area? All these things are still bounded by the laws of physics. Like, sound like it's living in an imaginary planet, universe, metaverse, or something, right? So, uh, so I think like that. It, that's why I'm saying this. This is all like great to reason about, but at this stage, like today, do we have anything that can just decide the training data for its own next gener- generation of model? No, humans yeah. aggressively curate what training data is used for training these large language models. Uh, humans come up with the evaluations. Humans come up with like deciding like what part of the data led to certain contamination and evals so or like regression, uh, go back and aggressively test hypothesis and stuff like that. So until we have the equivalent of an AI scientist that's completely autonomous, uh, there is just no way for an AI to self-improve itself. And therefore, we, we don't need to worry about these scenarios yet. Yeah, and, and I mean, I'm curious then about also about the the sort of robustness and security of um, <coughs> these systems. So, you know, I've been using Perplexity. I would say out of 300 queries, one or two have been, <laughs> I'd call them really out of distribution. Right? I was quite surprised. Mm-hmm. You know, I rely on it very, very well. But but we know that um, even with GPT-4, jailbreaks and prompt injections mm-hmm. are are quite hard to pr- protect from. Um, that seems to be a little bit like um, a, a, a design issue, right? I, I think a little bit about 
traditional nuclear power stations where you, you have this thing that is kind of fundamentally unsafe that you moderate through boron rods and, and cooling water. And then because it's so unsafe, you enclose it in denser and denser reinforced concrete um, to, to kind of make it safe. And you can design other types of reactors like small modular reactors that might be kind of based on thorium salts or something which are safe from the physics, right? They can't melt down. Um, and, and, I, and, you know, I, I just wonder about whether with the current design, the current way that we train these systems, the fact that it can't tell what is a parameter message going in and what's the user asking for a request, um, whether these things can actually ever be robust. Not robust 99 times out of 100, but if they're being used by billions of people as agents and the interface to everything we do, it's going to be multiple hundreds of times a day by multiple billions of people. That's right. Um, and so you have to have a really sort of unimpeachable, secure by design, trustworthy by design kind of structure. And I, I don't know if you can, can get there with, with, with LLMs at the heart. I mean, security is not largely about like making sure uh, the user doesn't feel like all their data is going into the training of the large language models, right? Like, and, 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 and they opt in if they want that to be the case. But, but security, the security is about whether you can trust the responses that come back, right? Especially as humans yeah. step out of the loop, right? That's right. But, yeah. Sure. So, so let me give you a perspective on our own iterations on this. When we started as a company, we tried two types of searches. Summarize unstructured search with citations. Structured searches with SQL queries on databases. Mm -hmm. The second one, we... Um, opened up a version just specifically on Twitter, like all all Twitter data, we organized it as a table and powered search on that. And you could ask questions like, who does Azim follow that, you know, like Demis Asabas doesn't follow or something like that, and it would give you like a table. Um, and we would put in the SQL query also along with the results so that people can verify what the table is actually coming from. But honestly, is that really useful? Like, you know, the whole point is you don't want to write the SQL, right? And if I give you the SQL for verification, like, yeah, like, oh, I don't know how to verify the SQL. On the other hand, like, look at the citation interface. Citation interface is so beautiful. You, you have the LLM answer, you have the citations at the top, you have the every sentence has the corresponding page that got the content this from. Is, this is your referencing and anchoring that you do in the answers that you give back. That's right. right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's perfect, right? Like it, it gets you whatever the, 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 the verification requirement for the user, the, it, it gets the 80-20 there. Um, and and um, so it's not just about what LLMs you use. I think it's also about the user interface, like how you design it. And uh, there are like, you know, so many places where you can go wrong. We got lucky there, honestly. I, I, the, cite, the, the citation interface simply came from, oh, like we are all academics doing a company and like what, as academics, what we love is citations. And so let's try to like adopt that style of talking. Uh, but then it turns out it's the best way, at least so far, to ensure an LLM generated answer can be verified by the end user. Yeah. So, so that that I mean, in a way, that provides some level of assurance within the the, the remit of, of perplexity. But I, I do I just sort of leave a placeholder, maybe something I'll return to with um, uh, in a, you know future conversation, uh, which yeah. is about you know given how important these things are going to be as infrastructure and interface, like what what needs to happen for there to be that kind of guarantee of trustworthiness. Um, as, especially as human humans step out of the loop. Um, I, I know we're running a bit short of time, but I did w want to ping you on on this question of open source and closed source for, for AI models. So I, you know, I come from a uh, like a really traditional internet world where stuff was open source and it seemed to work pretty well. Um, and uh, there's obviously this huge debate now where where you've got Jan Lacoon from from Meta and others saying things ought to be open source to create better quality, safer software, democratizes um, it, its access. And others saying these technologies are super powerful, they need to be closed. Um, how do you, when you look at that debate, how do you think it's, it's, it's evolving? So I think like the, it's not a traditional software thing, um, though I think that even by that reasoning, it makes more sense for things to be open source. Um, right. I, I, I feel like the, the people who are pushing for regulation of open source 
have fundamentally flawed reasoning which is they think that this thing is going to be too dangerous right now if they think this thing is too dangerous um they're also the ones that are raising a lot of funding to build the thing even faster <laughs> right so that means but by construction they're saying that this thing is too dangerous and we are the ones who are allowed to work on it and 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 uh we decide the rules for who is allowed to work on it and other people shouldn't work on it right or That's if they work on it they bought to go through the same process as us except they don't have as much money as us and 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 on all the initial lead we already have hmm. um okay that's still fine you know let them do what they want now think about whether if something is really dangerous do you want only few people who have an incentive to keep it to themselves and like have the advantage to themselves have the eyeballs on it or do you want more people to eyeballs on it especially those who don't have any financial incentive towards it right mm-hmm. um and the answer is obviously you want more eyeballs on it like more people should know what's going on right and the only way to do that is actually have things open source right yeah. um and 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 also if you want a pro competitive environment in this world um the more open source llms there are out there the more chances that there are people who can build products or other llms that are of a different nature different capability more efficient more cheaper or 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 come up with new breakthroughs um on top of the open source models outside these big labs mhm so given all these things it's actually a different thing from traditional software because the cost of building something here is tremendous i don't think there will be any more foundation model companies that can get started right um because the the, the amount of things that have to go right for you to start a foundation model company is just so much uh you have to have a great team you have to have a lot of gpus you have to have a lot of funding and then you have to have like some momentum already um and you no know, like this and you're already starting from behind if you start now so I that's know. why i think like yeah the people who the don't have comes. access to these models are going to suffer um and 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 um uh, until it is very clear through rigorous evaluations that these things have surpassed human level so much that it's worth you know thinking through at least the timeline of open source um i don't think we need to like really be worried about it and 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 i don't i definitely don't think we should be concerned about like only having i rather i would say we should be concerned about people who are trying to regulate open source because we should try to understand what their true incentives are here yeah you know yeah, the company think- is maximally threatened by open source mm are those who are in the middle layer where they raised substantial amount of funding they're not the top most companies they don't have the the best model they're like but they have a lot of money big cluster some team they don't have anything open source either where the community is rooting for them neither are they at the frontier of the top most frontier models either those companies are the ones actually pushing the hardest for regulation Oh is that right? I I mean I I've mostly heard it from, you know, the really big models, right? So you hear it from the guys who get to the safety summit and uh I I'm saying that the the ones who are really been working on the super hard mm-hmm. are the ones who are maximally threatened by open source. Right. Uh and of course I mean the top most guys like the ones who have the deep by scaring edge models they they do have an incentive for op- open source to be regulated but you know they're not going to be super affected by it if it happens that open source continues to be unregulated because they still open source lags behind the frontier models by a lot the ones who are really affected by open source are those who um don't have any anything good going for them today right right like their strategy is fundamentally at risk and and therefore it's clear that the true true argument for the, the true reason they're like going for all this is not really to care for humanity or something it's a commercial reason to like protect themselves yeah. so i i want i want to come come back to to one final question which is that um you know you've you've built a uh, a really fascinating uh product which i love thank you so much perplexity.ai um and 
but it, it, you know, this is a this is a moment. This is a an electricity internal combustion engine. It's a steam engine moment, which we yeah. arrive with the benefit of history. Right, we've been able to see the benefits and the the adjustment issues and all the other systemic societal um, uh, sort of spillover that a, a general purpose technology uh, creates. And we know this is happening faster and a much more interconnected. Um, economy. So, so with that, um, what would you like to see in the in the public debate, right? What should the, we know you want lots of people to use perplexity. Uh, I think they should. It's a great product. But what do you want to see in the public debate? What is a healthy set of conversations that help us adapt to the upside and, and also deal with what the potential spillover effects of this technology could be? I think the way I would like to see it is like people becoming more aware and learning how to use these tools rather than fighting them. That's that's what I would like to see. There are going to be people who are going to say like, oh, all their labor is being distilled into a model and then it's going to take over and feels unfair. But um, if this is the better way to like save the drudgery of like day to day mundane work, you know, there is a definition for work that stuff that you kind of do for getting paid but you don't really want to do because if you really want to do something it doesn't kind of count as work anymore it's you're, you're in play mode right um so if humans can see these things at scale if people can see these things at scale that this is the only way they can get liberate themselves from the drudgery of day-to-day -day work and learn to use these tools and you know have a more fun and fulfilling life that is the debate we need to have. Like, not a lot of people agree with this vision, and mm -hmm. I think we should hear from people who don't agree with this vision, and see yeah. what what their concerns are, and try to address them. And I think that that last point is a really important one. I mean, that's really what history um, history tells us, right? We know that with the uh, with the Luddites and the 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 the, the, the A frame and and so on, the issue was not about the mechanization. The issue was about the consultation and the distribution of of economic rewards. Um, and we know that during the nineteenth century, when it, it, England mechanized it, um, the labor wages fell well below GDP growth because the rewards were going to the providers of capital, and that's really what spurred. Uh, and catalyzed a lot of the labor and union movements that so you you started to see a new economic settlement at the start of the 20th century and I, and I guess this point that you make about hearing from people um, I would really I would really concur with right how do, we, how do we and how do people like you who are leading these companies establish mechanisms where voices not just actually you know in labor in work in the West but but you know more broadly from around the world can be heard during a process of, of actually quite rapid consultation that we that we need to have? I mean, I, I guess my focus is simply on like, has always been broadly motivated by the fact that um, in the age of these AGI-like tools, like you know, generally intelligent LLM tools, um, the barrier to entry and the access to information has to go down. Uh, access to information should go up and the barrier to entry to any new topic or field should go down. I think for me, with a tool like Perplexity, the idea is I, we just make it easy for anybody to start anything and learn about anything. And, 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 um, and, and, and also amplify their presence in the world. Like, you know, if you have more stuff out there, you, you can reach the consumer of the information even better, even more targeted than Google. Mm -hmm. and and um, and that's great and for me if, if, if this is achieved if this itself is achieved it's a big deal like where somebody who doesn't know anything about Silicon Valley can still start a company because most of the information is online but it's just not available in a consumable way in a personalized way in a conversational way right right so that's what we're doing and and this brings us back to uh, your favorite query on perplexity which was how do you find just the perfect engagement ring yeah, uh, for your partner yeah, exactly. in a so world where that information you, is hard you to have, access. You have access to somebody who's bought it before, and like you know, you got to talk to like five different people. What What about people who don't know people? Like, what about people who don't have friends who who done this before? Right, right. Yeah, 
that is that is a moment a moment of of democratization of yeah, the exactly. opportunity the democracy and the information of knowledge, like knowledge yeah i mean our, our our mission is to be the earth's most knowledge centric company and you know we want to be the ultimate knowledge app so there's a quote uh that says knowledge has a beginning but no end mm-hmm. and yeah. the beginning that's why if you go to our site say where knowledge begins it right. begins here but it doesn't have to end you know Anywhere, no, in fact we don't you stop. said you have done 200 queries like I, I want people to do a million queries like each person should do a million queries like that that's the ultimate thing and each query should be way higher intent than than the previous query and 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 that, 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 that's the idea. Like you're, you're not typing in two or three keywords here. You're actually digging deeper and learning. And the whole civilization gets smarter if they just can consume information in a way that was never possible before. And, and, if, and, and in general, a smarter planet is a better planet. Uh, Aravind, with perplexity, you are helping us take those, uh, those first few steps. Thanks so much for taking the time today.